Okay, so this video is, is a second of a three-part series on epistemy. And what I want to do with this video in particular is talk about my affiliation with the metamodern political movement. Because I think it's important to, to remember that uh, the political coalitions, they kind of exist because there's a common goal among its members. But it's also important that we remember that we act as kind of individual agents from within these movements. So the movement kind of remains self-critical and can, can keep refreshing itself and make sure um, that it has the right dialogue for, for the public. So what I'm going to do with this video is talk about, I'm going to frame it in terms of the good and the bad and, and also what I find ugly about the movement. But of course, we need to start off with the good to even know why spending time on the bad and, and some of the ugly aspects are worth reviewing. So if I'm, if I'm to do that, to talk about the good, I think we, we, we start with thinking about the metamodern movement as a reaction to, um, to, the, to the kind of the cynical and the self-deprecating uh, movement that we saw in the 90s. You know, if, if we think of uh, even the music that came out of the 90s, like Nine Inch Nails, you know, you had this, the, these lyrics, you know, saying, I cut myself today. And, and, and then you've got things like Radiohead, where they were saying, I'm a creep. And then there was a back, I'm a loser. You know, why don't you kill me? So, so, you know, for us growing up in the 90s, this was a very dominating narrative, this very self-critical, self-deprecating, very cynical type of attitude. You know, I think one of the best examples of this aesthetic that the metamodern movement is kind of reacting to is South Park. You know, in South Park, that show was making fun of everybody. There was no one, it was almost kind of the, the tagline of the movie when, or the, the show when people talked about it. There was like no one that no one was safe from being critiqued. Everyone was open for criticism. And if we think of the symptoms that we were living with in the 1990s, you know, we were living in a very large democracy, certainly in the United States. And I think the individual was feeling very small in this massive empire. You know, we were feeling very apathetic to democracy. And, and, and we were feeling quite estranged from each other. And we were quite disappointed, you know, that, that democracy couldn't manifest the voice of the people. And, and, you know, science was supposed to overthrow religious superstition. And we weren't really seeing a lot of the benefits which the modernization of the world was supposed to bring to us. So it's, it's not really a surprise that we saw kind of this uh, aesthetic reaction to all of the promises that were kind of given to us through modernization, which weren't realizing. So this kind of postmodern movement, I think it was a reaction to living with, with the consequences of this whole process of modernization and building these massive empires and living within these world empires. But I don't think that this postmodern aesthetic that the metamodern movement is reacting to is just kind of some angsty white teenagers, because you can also uh, take the example of, of the marginalization which kind of overcame uh, the black community or, or the indigenous people. So I think the postmodern uh, kind of critique of the whole process of modernization, which was something that was definitely needed. But, you know, after some time of living in this world where you're very cynical and self-critical and, and very pessimistic and, and, and nothing is, is free from being criticized, you know, you, you can't live in that aesthetic for very long. You, after some time, you do want to start making some healthy uh, and, and kind of romantic and positive and, and, and affirmative ways of being in the world. And I think that's what the metamodern movement is now trying to commandeer. They're trying to take over a bit of a more romantic view to life and kind of get back to some of those ideals again of the, of the modern period, get back to that, that kind of ideal of constructing some healthy worlds for us to live in. But at the same time, take account of that critique, take account of that postmodern critique that we found ourselves in. And, I, and, and for myself, I mean, this meta-modern narrative has been very helpful. I mean, it's no lie in these videos. I'm trying to put forward some really, you know, dramatic statements. I'm trying to put forward some real political prescriptions here. And, and, it, and when I do this on the internet, for example, I think the internet is a really good 
place where we find a lot of this cynicism and this, and this critique and this and, and being very cynical and pessimistic. You know, I find a lot of people who, who aren't digesting these prescriptions very well. So having that metamodern narrative and knowing that we need to at some point put some real prescriptions forward, it is very empowering. But at the same time, I don't mean to put the internet down. I mean, to be honest, there is a lot of shit out there. That's kind of the idea of the internet. Everything is connected and there is tons of crap out there. So it's very natural for people to be very, you know, have their shields up, to be very cynical towards all of that and, 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 and you know, have not only one filter, but have many layers of filters. I mean, I think it's very, it's what I would expect out of the internet, out of kind of a construction like the internet. And I think that this is a bit a hint of to where the metamodern narrative goes wrong a bit. I think that being on the internet might not be the healthiest place for this because to be to to put forward some some very romantic and affirmative prescriptions you need some intimacy. You need a bit more close environment. And you need to have longer dialogues and I'm not sure the internet is really the place to have those long dialogues. And at the same time, I think the internet is a place where you address the world. You're addressing everybody on the internet, potentially. Potentially everybody's on the internet listening to you. And so it feels, if you put forward, you know, very uh, romantic views on life, very affirmative um, prescriptions towards constructions on the internet, you're making a claim to build another type of empire, just like we were doing during the modern era. And this is where I think the, me the meta-modern narrative can start to feel wrong. It can start to feel like it's really bound up with that human comportment that I talked about of epistemy. So there's this one philosopher who's a part of this meta-modern community. And he's also on YouTube. And he's actually really, I really like his videos. His name is Yap the New Paradigm Fish, and I, I'll put a link at the bottom of this video and you definitely check him out because this guy, he's quite amazing and he's very original. I would say one, that's probably his best quality is how original he is. And he's almost, his method for kind of teaching philosophy in front of a camera, he almost feels like a rapper to be honest. He's kind of got his hands in the air and he's kind of just kind of going with a chain of words and they almost rhyme but not really and they kind of it's a very directive rather than kind of definitional type of philosophy and it's, it's quite entertaining but you know even this guy the way that he talks about the constitution of the human being and he kind of talks about the mind in this mental engine he's kind of talking about the human as as something that's always going out and trying to apprehend the world. And I like that word apprehension because it kind of has that dual meaning of both kind of apprehending, mm. but also that strong sense like when, when you say like the police have apprehended the criminal, they've kind of taken it into their custody. So there's kind of this undertone of this epistemy that I've been talking about, this going out and attacking phenomena and owning it. And then there's this other metamodern, and I, I'm, I'm kind of quick to call this guy the metamodern historian because he's kind of very good at taking account of the whole history of this movement and tracing it even before it became a, an actual articulate movement itself. And his name is Brent Cooper. And this guy is almost like pure epistemi incarnate. I mean, he is, he is just trying to have as much information, the, the more information, the better with this guy. And you know, he's, he's really interested in kind of national and global solutions. And he's a, he's a guy who actually believes that someone like Bernie Sanders could be the, the be all end all solution for the United States. That like all of a sudden we won't have this, this divide anymore between the left and the right if we get Bernie. But I really think all this demand for knowledge that's required to have this kind of more knowledge, the better type of thinking. It actually gets in the way of people meeting each other. You know, if I meet someone in a conversation and all of a sudden I feel like that person doesn't have enough information, well, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna ask them to go do their research and come back and talk to me. So I think often this demand for knowledge is getting in the way of people actually coming together and having a conversation and meeting each other. And I think about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, 
the community was really interested in talk of hyper complexity, you know, kind of thinking of the world in terms of data. We've got these computers that can make these calculations. We can set up all these sensor points within the world. And with all of this data, we could collect and build and, and, and we could then put forward the best prescriptions. And all we need is more information and to be able to comprehend and to deal with this hyper complexity. But when I heard this conversation come up, I didn't really see a good progression of the conversation. I actually saw, what I saw was it, it kind of stopped the conversation. As soon as we'd started talking about hyper complexity, well, none of us had the information required to progress from there. And I, I don't think that anyone does. And so the conversation really stopped once we got there. It felt like there was a lot of energy. We got really excited, but it didn't go anywhere. And, and you know, especially for us theorizers, us philosophers and politicians, you know, we need something really concrete to work with. So it really just died out. So if I'm to remain true to the title of this video, then I would call this the, the bad of the metamodern movement. I think that there's, from what I feel, there's too much empire building going on. And you know, many, many of these metamoderns, they start even with that very modern metaphysics, that Cartesian metaphysics, where there's an I subject and there's an it object. So there's this dichotomy of the, the, the subject and the object, and it's based on these pronouns. And then they want, to, they want to build even a more complex language by adding a we to that, and then saying that that pronoun we refers to another metaphysical object called intersubjectivity. So you'd have the subject, the object, and then there's this other realm of intersubjectivity. And that, and that we're living in something of an of a integrated pluralism. Like an, we, we, that to, to, to live with this intersubjectivity in a productive way, we need to integrate the plurality of the world. And this would be the way to overcome that marginalization of, of, of the individual and also the, the groups of you know, indigenous people. And we can, by listening to everybody's voice, we can, be, we can build our empires but we cannot fall into the trap that we fell into during the modern era. This is kind of the idea with this integrated pluralism, which is a coinage by, by the psychologist Greg Hendricks. And I think it's a really good coinage of an idea that I just don't agree with. It's a bit like, it's a bit like when I read Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene. I thought it was a great book. I tell people it's one of the book, best books that I ever read that kind of painted a picture of the world that I just don't agree with. And I think in this regard, as far as kind of redeeming the marginalized groups of people and redeeming the, the, the marginalized in general, I think, I think there's actually another movement that I've encountered that I think is doing the job a bit better. And it's a, it's a, it's a project that comes out of the UN and the UNESCO project, and it's called Futures Literacy. And there's this one activist, a part of this, this program called Bayo Akamalov. And he's interested in what he was calling kind of redeeming the global South, kind of redeeming, um, yeah, the marginalized people that haven't had a voice through this, this modern, postmodern, kind of metamodern narrative, this kind of colonial narrative. But I think he rightfully recognizes that, that kind of integrating others into our story it kind of creates a feeling that there's only one path to follow on this path towards modernization. And it, it, it feels at that point a bit like the same critique which Martin Luther King Jr. gave to, to the philosopher Hegel when he said that the many are subsumed under the one. You know, it's almost like we don't like this idea of real diversity. And, and this idea of the exotic, you know, and this is this kind of idea of the exotic is actually a word I've really latched onto and want to do some exploration with, because it seems to me that, that kind of any real authentic encountering of new ideas is going to happen kind of beyond the empire, so to speak. It's going to happen in those areas which we which we deem kind of beyond the frontier and that exoticness. So, and now the ugly, because I think this want for kind of one knowledge and, and one value system and one empire or nation, I do think that often it's, it's, it is built 
on fear, even in the metamodern community. I do think that there is some fear mongering going on. You know, sometimes we, there's talk of this mass political systems failure or, or the apocalypse of climate change. And, I, and while maybe some of these things are real, like, you know, if we're very much worried about right-wing authoritarianism or something like that, I don't think that that return to romanticism that, that metamodern is promising should be built on this fear-mongering. You know, and even if we had this, this one government that was managing the, the, the hyper-complexity and, and whose values were kind of so generic that they were able to resonate within everyone, even if we had this set up in the world, you know, I don't, I, I want to ask, like, who would actually be happy in this environment? Because I'm not sure that anyone would, because I think that they're in, in, the, in this very complex system, there's too much hierarchy. Now, one of my favorite metamodern philosophers, her name is Benita Roy, and I would probably call her probably my, my favorite living philosopher in general. She's coined something quite great, and she's not interested in even taking account of all of the information necessarily, and then not even reducing that information such that we could then operate with it. She's interested in what she calls releasing complexity. And for myself, it doesn't feel like there's any better release from complexity than, than re-scoping the horizons of human economy. And you know I've been championing for localization in these videos because I really feel that that is the answer for making our lives more actionable and making them more meaningful and consequent and, and even just understandable. And of course, if we are localizing, it doesn't mean that at the same time we're kind of cutting ourselves off from the world. It doesn't mean I'm talking about creating little pockets that don't communicate with each other. That's not even possible anyway. We've got the internet and all of this stuff to contend with. I mean, and for myself even, I'm an immigrant to Denmark, you know? I'm an American who's immigrated to Denmark, so how does that reconcile with this prescription of localizing world disclosure that I've been talking about? Well, for myself, I give lectures here in, in, in Denmark at Spinderholana, and I've got a few exhibitions planned, some exhibitions that I'd like to curate, some art exhibitions. So you can still localize your life and scope your horizons locally and, and have migration within and among the, 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 these little local pockets within the world. That, that's still very possible. But even for myself, you know, I've actually stopped lecturing. And you know why? Because I've been distracted by that global discourse. You know, Donald Trump got elected and everyone had a heyday. And I felt like I had some really good philosophy that, that might give us a good language for talking about that. So we always have this global dialogue that seems to be pulling us out and distracting us from the local. But I really believe that that is where the good political moves are to happen, is to go local.